Friday night special delivery. It is the Shout Buffalo Football Podcast back in your life for the third time this week. Bills Mafia, they're taking care of us, Ryan Talbot. Did you see these numbers from Wednesday night watching the Von Miller special on Buffalo Bills on NY Up? 16,000 already? You guys are too good to us, man. I mean, I'm just so grateful. Bills Mafia, huge week for the city, huge week for the fan base, huge week for the show. Like I mentioned, he's Ryan Talbot. I'm Matt Perino. This is Shout, a Buffalo football podcast brought to you by Tops Friendly Markets, your neighborhood store. Whether you're celebrating the Von Miller signing at home with friends, out at a party, maybe in a park. You could be in a park right now, Ryan Talbot. It's beautiful beautiful in Western New York. Tops has all your fan favorites ready to enjoy for football, entertaining, or any occasion. You you just got out of, out of bed. You took a little afternoon nap. It's been a long week, but I feel supercharged all of a sudden, Ryan Talbot. Um, it's been a really like exhilarating week covering this team, free agency, uh, and there's a ton to talk about tonight. Oh, tons to talk about. Excited to talk about it. Break it down with the Bills Mafia. Um, Thank you, Bills Mafia, for that support, like Matt was saying. And you know what's funny, Matt? You were just talking about the weather. Uh, I don't know if you remember it vividly or not, but when Mario Williams signed with the Bills years and years and years ago, it was that it was uncharacteristically warm in Western New York when he came Mm -hmm. in. And it's kind of like the whole Von Miller thing. Von Miller comes in from L.A. and, and we're having... 60 degree 70 degree weather you know that i hope he doesn't uh expect that normally in march this time of year but boy it sure has been nice this week i always i laugh here because i always get everybody knows that i get little in episode notes for my wife uh if i'm doing something that she doesn't like she hates when i like wiggle my nose or like um there's a lot of little like mannerisms that she's like stop doing that uh and so i just get get kind of used to it i went upstairs to get a drink of water before um, before we started the show and she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, getting water. And she's like, well, we're waiting. And I'm like, waiting for what? She's like, I looked cause I could see the reflection of the TV in the, in the window. And she's got the, she got the YouTube link ready to go. And she's like, we're waiting for the show to start. My, her and my son were up there. She just texted me and she's like, by the way, FYI, I hate that you always say shout a Buffalo football podcast and not shout the Buffalo football podcast. So that's actually a great note. We're going to change. We're going to change the intro. It is shout the Buffalo football podcast. Uh, that's, you know, my, my, my wife had a, a long week at work, too. And, you know, what 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 uh, what she wants, she gets. So there you go, Ryan Talbot. I like it. I like it. Yeah. You know, it, it does say right here in big letters, the Buffalo football podcast. Uh, easy to definitely get that mixed up, though. And uh, just excited to start breaking things down. So where do you want to start, Matt? So Von Miller. I, I, I think we still got to talk a, quite a bit about all of this because we, we got a chance to, to talk to Brandon Bean today about what this what went into this signing, right? And so we're going to get into Brandon Bean's press conference. There's a lot of takeaways that I have. Uh, he commented on Starla Tulele, Cole Beasley, uh, obviously what happened with the J.D. McKissick situation. We'll get mm-hmm. into that as well. But first and foremost, let's go to Von Miller's press conference yesterday. Let's start there, Ryan. What was the number one takeaway that you walked away uh, from that press conference with? You know, Von Miller's first comments as a Buffalo Bill. Yeah, how torn he was uh, on this decision. You know, obviously the Bills offered more money, more years, uh, but it was still a very tough decision for him. And he spent over three minutes just t- kind of talking about how much he enjoyed his time with the Rams and all the talent there coming off of a Super Bowl. Uh, the fact that it was kind of just like a, a, a Pro Bowl roster of sorts there. Uh, so he spent all that time kind of breaking down. And I loved his line where he said it was like leaving a girlfriend and the girlfriend did nothing wrong. He was just leaving mm-hmm. that girlfriend for another girlfriend. So he was clearly torn. But at, at the end of all that, because if you're sitting there listening, listening, you're like, holy cow, he, he's still hung up on his previous girlfriend. He did write the ship in terms of talking about Josh Allen and and the bills and why he ended up coming to uh, to this team, to this franchise, what he thinks this team can do. Uh, But yeah, the the fact that he was so torn and he was so open and honest about it was the one thing that really stood out to me. What about you? Like from a bills fans perspective perspective, did you think that that was something that after all the hoopla around Vaughn, that that was kind of like a, a letdown that he was so hung up 
did you, did you feel like that was the takeaway from the press conference? Is that the way that you're you're kind of seeing it, or more just that that LA meant that much to him that you just that was something you observed? Yeah, just the latter, just that it meant so much to him. He, I mean, he had spent his entire career up until that point in Denver, and, and he just was the right situation. Uh, everything came together perfectly. Tons of talent there. He's You mentioned a great article, nyupsyracuse.com, that Matt put up uh, about how, you know, the, the fashion, the made-for-LA type of personality, and yet here he is in, in Western New York wanting mm-hmm. to be here, mind you. Uh, and choosing the Bills because he feels they're on the cusp of a Super Bowl themselves. But, yeah, it was just something that I I personally came away with at the end of that presser. Mm-hmm. I saw some stuff on, on social media uh, from Bills fans about, like, kind of, all right, all right, move on. You signed all this money for the for, for this big contract. You're with the Bills now. Like, move on from L.A. And I, you know, that was a very small segment. I only saw a few of those comments. But I think what I took away from that particular part of the press conference was just the raw nature, the emotions of it, right? Like one of the things that Vaughn said was that what he brings more than, you know, maybe one B to being this elite pass rusher is this ultimate teammate, a guy that, you know, he has made it a point over the course of his career to study and understand the culture in the building and then be kind of like a beacon of that culture for the team, not only in the good years, but the bad years as well. He's had Super Bowl to the playoffs and he's going to bring that and be, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, veteran or player driven leadership that Sean McDermott talks so much about. Von Miller is that that guy for what is going to happen here. And so you you go back a month, two months. He spent 104 days. That's it. 104 days in L.A. after the grind of a 10-year career in Denver, right? And it was this just whirlwind of experience. You go to L.A., the bright lights, the beautiful weather, you know, the the Pro Bowl environment inside the locker room. Cooper Cups there, Jalen Ramsey, Aaron Donald, Matthew Stafford. Everywhere that you look, there's big-time players. And I feel like he just, it was like going on vacation. Right. Like it made going to work every day so easy. And then you put a bow on top of everything with a Super Bowl championship. I think not going back to that, to to what that like emotional feeling was that, um, you know, the, the feelings that that conjured up, it was real. And he shared that and he went for three and a half minutes. I was blown away at Vaughn. Like he wasn't asked one single question. He came to the mic and he just started shooting from the hip. And it was it was really cool to hear him talk about all of that. And what I think I took away from how hard of a decision it was and how much it affected him is how much he's fallen in love with what not only the Buffalo bills have built bills, mafia and all of the things that, you know um, the brand of it all now, because the bills there, that's a synonymous brand around the NFL and around the country. I mean, when you meet people in the airport and they ask you where you're from and you say you're from Buffalo, one of the first things out of their mouth is usually Bill's Mafia. Have you ever been through a table? Best fans in the NFL. So people know about the, the culture of football in, in Western New York. But I think the thing that really stood out to me, and you mentioned it before the show, and you can talk a little bit about what he said about Josh Allen. It's what he thinks the Bills can do. Sometimes, Ryan, in, this, in, in, in the professional sports world, you know, I came from – MMA and and UFC and you know when you win the championship and you defend the championship after a while like it's hard to get up and get up and get up we've seen so many Super Bowl teams have that like a little bit of a malaise coming off of the, the the glow of a Super Bowl and I think what this shows me about Von Miller is he's reaching for the next wall that he can break through the next the the next first thing that he can do nobody's ever won a championship with three different teams he could become the first one to do that i think that excites him that uh gets him up out of bed it's gonna he's gonna turn 33 shortly here um and that's what i think he's embracing in buffalo and that's what he sees the opportunity for buffalo the buffalo bills to go win a championship yeah and you mentioned the fans and and, you know i I do wonder how much of that that played a factor in the decision too And, and i'm not trying to knock the rams uh their fan base or anything like that but it's it's a very fair weather uh city the the parade was pretty pathetic looking leading up (laughs) to it um and he and he mentioned the bills mafia and he's excited for that atmosphere and and the crowd going nuts and they absolutely will they they supported this team through the good and the bad and they're gonna be in uh you know they're gonna be selling out the place no question in my mind these next few years 
Uh, and it's going to be quite the atmosphere there. But yeah, you mentioned the Josh Allen factor. I love that he called him a creature a few times mm-hmm. in that presser. Um, it, it's it's just kind of what you expect when you have that franchise quarterback. It's what we saw for many, many years, actually, in the AFC East when Tom Brady was with the Patriots. Players not necessarily taking a discount because Von Miller didn't take a discount, uh, but players wanting to come and play with that franchise quarterback, that that player that he they think could help them win a Super Bowl. Uh, and, and that's where Josh Allen is in his career at this point. He's like someone that has proven that he is legitimate, that he is one of those top echelon QBs. And, and Von Miller wants to be that missing piece to kind of get them over the hump. And, and the Bills have added a few players that might be those missing pieces. But no piece has been more important this offseason than Von Miller. My big takeaway from Von uh, Von's press conference, other than the stuff that we've already talked about, you know, he kept kind of coming back a few times, you know, and rightfully so, talking about how crazy it feels to walk away from a situation when you're lining up next to Aaron Donald. And that was something that the more you get into thinking about it, how much easier was life for Von Miller in those three and a half months, knowing that every day he showed up, everybody else on the op- the opposing team, that, that entire offensive line group, they're in a lot of ways game planning for Aaron Donald before they're game planning for Von Miller. As crazy as that is to say about the guy, I think that that's what was happening. And so he walks away from that, and I actually asked him in the press conference, is like to go from Aaron Donald to what you're going to kind of have to be here, which is more of that mentor, bringing a lot of these younger guys along. Was that something that, you know, how much of that affected your decision? And he's like, listen, I would not have come to here to the Bills if I didn't think I was going to have some rushing buddies. He said he's actually studied Greg Rousseau, A.J. Epinesa, Boogie Basham. He's liked what he's seen already. I think it was A.J. Epinesa who actually attended his pass rushing summit uh, last offseason. I think we wrote about that. I think you wrote about that at the site. Mm -hmm. And so already a relationship there. I'm sure Greg Rousseau is going to want to get into the – uh, the film room with Vaughn and start breaking it down. I'll never forget a story. Jeremiah Searles told me uh, a couple years ago, he might've even said it on the show at some point, but you know, he got to Buffalo and this is a guy that, you know, a little bit different than Von Miller. He was like a, you know, a utility man, a kind of like a journeyman of sorts. He'd tell you that. And he basically said he got in the building and he was just grinding through tape. And, you know, he kind of saw some of the younger guys. Like I think he pulled on, pulled along like Deion Dawkins and Wyatt Teller. And he'd be like, Hey guys, I know we watched our film today, but now the, you know, the, the extra film work starts Get in the film room. And let's start getting after this. And you need that kind of mentor in the room. And they had Jerry Hughes and they had Mario Addison, but I think watching, and this is not to downplay Jerry Hughes and what he's done in the NFL, but to watch film with Von Miller, one of the best mm. edge rushers in the history of the game. That's just, that's just a game changer. And he was very complimentary of Ed Oliver. I think that he's really excited about, potentially what he can be and and the effect that he can have on him now that the two are going to be rushing together. Yeah. I like what you mentioned there about Aaron Donald, you know, Von freaking Miller, this guy's going to be a first ballot hall of famer when, when his time comes and teams weren't concerned about him necessarily more than they were Aaron Donald. And, you know, you can make a case for Jalen Ramsey uh, in terms of not throwing his way. So he, he could have been really the, the third guy you talked about on that Rams defense in Buffalo, at least up front, he's going to be choice A, 1A, um, and, and that's no knock on Ed Oliver or any of the running mates that he has in front of him, the new additions, the new faces. So now, you know, I don't want to say the pressure's back on, but now he is that the, the face of this defensive line, and he's going to be leading the way, and uh, it, it's going to be interesting. You mentioned Epineza with the Pass Rush Summit. Uh, you can go all the way back to Epineza meeting with the Bills in the pre-draft process. And at that time, he didn't realize that McDermott and Bean were on that Carolina team that lost the Super Bowl to, to Von Miller and the Broncos. And he mentioned that the one Von Miller pass rush move that he he's trying to master and get locked down and to bat the, the ball away from the quarterback and cause those fumbles. So he's he's kind of modeled his game after Von Miller for many years in his career. So to actually get to work with the guy. That's huge for the development of A.J. Epineza. And it's huge for guys like Russo and Boogie Basham and whoever mm-hmm. else could come in, whether it's via draft or still in free agency. Um, th- there's going to be a lot of guys that are going to learn a lot in, in these next few years under the Von Miller learning tree. So let's get to Brandon Bean's press conference today because and the, the hat was kind of giving me a little bit of a weird glare off the light. Um 
because he talked a little bit, you know, in detail today about the Von Miller deal, how it came together. And actually our good buddy, Dan Fates over at, uh, uh, wham in, uh, Rochester, he put out a really funny video. I think it had a little, uh, um, uh, little loop of a, a spongebob skit or something like that but it basically shows the clip of brandon bean uh at his season ending press conference and saying you know just so everybody knows we're not going to be big spenders then it goes hmm. a few moments later and his von miller like what's up bills mafia and it's just like a, it's like a cool clip like to kind of show the juxtaposition of what he, what he said and what he had, a, went on to do and there's you know a few things that kind of went into this first of all brandon bean said today there that he's checked in on Von Miller going back to his Denver days multiple times. I mean, that's the sense that I got today. I don't actually think he said multiple times. He mentioned a specific time when there was a regime change last off season. Uh, he checked in on Von Miller's availability because that's what happens a lot. I mean, you look in Chicago this year, Khalil Max gets traded after a whole new regime comes in. They're trying to kind of build that thing from the ground up and they're not going to be competitive for a couple of years. You want to get a lot of that salary out. And, you know, the other thing that interesting that Brandon Bean said is sometimes it just doesn't work from a compensation perspective, whether it be what a team has to give up to acquire a player. I mean, look, look at the Rams. They went all in. They won a Super Bowl. It was worth it, right? But they give up a second and I believe a fourth round pick, and now they're not left with the player. And that was literally four months ago, Ryan. And so now that that's why you know when when people wanted uh, Brandon Bean to be aggressive at the trade deadline, sure, like it, there there's a chance it could pay off. But you could trade for Von Miller at 32 years old. He can you know suffer an injury and miss time, and then you're out of the draft picks, and then you you're, you're you don't have the player either. So there's so many of those kinds of things that go into it. The other thing that I took away from uh, Bean's press conference today is him talking about how much work they did to vet Von Miller in terms of wanting to be in Buffalo or not. Like it's one thing to say that you like want, I didn't see that comment by the way. Um, I, so I'll you throw, up. yeah, throw it back up. Yeah. It just um, made me laugh. I tell my husband, I'm not going to spend a lot of money and then continually turn heels, turn heel on that. <laughs> that's <laughs> great. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Um, that's a great example of how it works, you know? And I think, to, but to Bean's point, it's like, I'm going into this and it's gotta be the perfect situation for me if I'm Brandon Bean. And I think that that's, what's kind of worked this whole time. Stefan Diggs, he checked in on multiple times before the actual trade was right from the perspective of the bills were ready to give up the capital and the Minnesota Vikings were ready to come to the table and actually make the deal. It's gotta work out. He said, and I asked him, how urgent was the situation to go out and sign Von Miller after you miss on Chandler Jones? Mac gets, you know, gets dealt in this big trade. There's this arms race happen happening in the AFC right now. The AFC is just absolutely stacked with talent. How much did you feel like, okay, I got to make a move here because everybody else is. And he's like, it's been an, it's been that way for two years. Even if you couldn't tell, I've it's always been urgent. I've always wanted to fill that spot at edge rusher. I wanted to upgrade that position, but it had to make sense on all sides of the thing, especially when you get to a point where you're going to pay a player, you have to know all of it is going, everybody's on the same page. And that's ultimately what le led to this Von Miller deal. Everybody was on this, on the same page, the bills, Miller, his, his reps, and the, the, the folks behind the scenes who Brandon talked about that had to make all the numbers work here because the Bills literally are sitting right now just under the cap with maybe a move or two that I think that he still has planned. One of them could be Matt Mar Barkley, who mm -hmm. tweeted out that it uh, looks like he's coming back to Buffalo. Um, they're getting the band back together. They're just running this thing all the way back. I think it was Joe Marino who said maybe John Brown's next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, first and foremost, w with the whole Von Miller thing and, and the money involved, uh, I shared something again last night that we wrote in early February from Joe Shane and the Giants, how he said, yeah, we were gonna have a little bit of money there to work with mm -hmm. it in Buffalo. And at the time when I when we published it, uh, we we're like, yeah, I don't know what money he was talking about. But sure enough, you know, he wasn't wrong. The bills had money they could move around restructures. Uh, cuts and, and, and things that they could do. And, and it's really come to fruition. Uh, I, I do. One thing I really appreciate about, about Brandon Bean is how open on, and honest he is. And, and he talked about how he went uh, throughout this process to Von Miller's reps and said, listen, we got to make sure that he, he is honest. You know, he is serious about coming here. We can't be wasting our time on this. We have other, uh, we, you know, we have to know because there's other targets out there that we might have to pursue this, that, and the other. And, 
Von Miller has said from the get-go he, he was interested in the Bills. He wanted to come to Buffalo. So this is one of those deals that where it worked out. Both sides are obviously happy with the outcome. Uh, and now, you know, on paper, this team has gotten significantly better up front. And, and that goes back to the urgency that Brandon Bean is looking for. Matt, we've talked about this. When uh, the, the Bengals put things together to defeat the Chiefs in the AFC Championship, it was rush three, play eight back. You can rush Von Miller and, and two others and play coverage back uh, against a team like the Chiefs now. And uh, you, you have that piece, that chess piece that can actually get after the quarterback. You don't need to scheme something up. You don't have to send the extra man necessarily. This is big for this defense. As good as the secondary has been over these last few years, I think they could potentially be even better uh, because you have that pass rusher up front that can get after the QB now. The numbers are starting to simmer here on the YouTube channel. If you're watching on YouTube, smash that like button. Let's get those likes up. Get some more people in here joining us on a Friday night talking Buffalo Bills football. Uh, this this depth chart's looking all types of different right now. But, you know, one of the big things that I think we have to get into here is the names that aren't going to be on the depth chart. Uh, obviously, in the last two days, big time headlines and in, in a lot of ways ended the the, the months long saga for Cole Beasley and Starla Tulale, two of the most polarizing figures, of course, of the COVID era. But, you know, Star, I'd put in a, a polarizing category of his own for the since the bill signed him. I mean, I don't think there, you know, there's a big chunk of the fan base that wasn't thrilled with that contract when it happened. You know, Bar Brandon Bean said to this said today that, you know, there, there, there's some fans that never really kind of grasped you know, the way that we saw Star Latula, like, you know, he doesn't have the splashy stats. Uh, they asked him to do a specific thing, but they move on from Cole yesterday. They allowed him to go out and look for a trade. Um, Brandon Bean basically said, listen, it's a guy that came to us, basically said he didn't want to be here anymore. And we want people that, that do want to be here. And so we tried, he's meant a lot to the success of the bills to Josh Allen. So they wanted to get him in a spot that made sense. He basically did admit that there was no tangible offers. There were some conversations, but nothing that really got down the road close to a trade. And so the Bills uh, release him, gets him about $6 million in cap space. And then the star release, Ryan, is really interesting because it's a lot of people thought it would be a post-June 1st cut because that would give them $4 million in cap space uh, additionally instead of um, $1.5 for a pre-June 1st cut. And now they're eating a 7.7 .7 million dead cap hit. That's the move that they made. They need that one and a half million so bad that they decided to make it a pre June, June 1st cut and just cut them outright. And now that's where they're sitting. And, and, and from Brandon Bean, it, he basically said, we felt it was best for both sides to just get a fresh start. Yeah. You know, first and foremost, with start the tool. I, I think the, the reason they also did the cut the way they did is, Next year is when Josh Allen's cap really starts to explode and all that. So you might as well just, uh, you know, take that bullet now, so to speak, with the dead cap and, and just kind of absorb it, get it done and out of the way. Latula was one of the rare cases where it, it felt like an overpay from day one. And mind you, they took over a roster and a team that wasn't uh, where it is today by any stretch of the imagination. So you signed him for uh, four for 40. You could have argued at the time that they signed him. He was already showing signs of, of decline, uh, but he, he served his purpose here. Uh, the Bills built things up the right way. It was someone that they had some experience with, but obviously, uh, you know, the, the last year or two, um, things kind of soured a little bit, obviously with the fan base and then, and then with the team as well. You could kind of see the writing on the wall uh, when – Sean McDermott met with the media and he was asked about Latule and he pretty much said, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see where everyone's at. He didn't want to give uh, too much information. And then I think he knew at that point in time, obviously Latule was not part of their plans. Cole Beasley, uh, you know, no matter what you think about Cole Beasley and how things ended here, I think it is really important to put in perspective how good he was for Josh Allen, uh, how much he played a role in Allen's development when, when he signed with the bills, Allen was still a big wild card in terms of what he was going to be in the NFL in terms of, you know, was he going to be a franchise QB? Was he going to be a middle of the road type of player? The accuracy issues were still there at the time. And Cole Beasley bet on Josh Allen and said, listen, I believe in this guy. I want to be somewhere where I can help contribute a little bit more than I was in Dallas. And 
sure enough, 82 receptions the past two years, an all pro season one year. Um, he was very important for where this team currently is now. So off field stuff aside, uh, you know, your, your feelings on him with the whole COVID matters, the, the racking up a hundred thousand dollars in fines. That's fine. If you don't like him for those reasons, but he did play such a vital role to where the bills are today. The shout Buffalo football fan base is awesome. Our guy, Scott Maranto out at the bar with the boys tonight. Look at this. He's got the shout buff, uh, the Buffalo football podcast on the big screen. Look at them eating some pizza, some wings, having some beers. Cheers, fellas. Thank good. you for the support. We appreciate you. Uh, yeah, we love all you guys. Uh, hit that like button. Subscribe to the channel. If this is your first time here, uh, we're going to get into loads more on this Friday night. Uh, a little, another interesting nugget on this whole, uh, and I want to, I mean, we could talk a little bit about them too, Jordan Phillips and Jack Lawson, but so little story, right? Remember back a couple months ago at the KC game, I had mentioned after the game that uh, hmm. Jordan Phillips was in the lot tailgating for bills versus chiefs in the playoff game. He's, he's uh, from uh, close to close to there. Uh, he made the drive. He actually said at his press conference yesterday, he's, he hasn't missed the game, a bills game. Uh, whether he had to watch it live or tape it and watch it back since he left. That's how much he missed it, the relationships that he built here. And one of those relationships was Starla Tulele, best friends. He called him his like his brother. And so he was in a Starla Tulele jersey at the game. That's what that's actually how I found him. When I was driving to my parking spot, I see a 98 jersey and driving around the lots for these games week after week, you don't see a lot of 98 Starla Tulele jersey. So it stuck out to me. And so Anyway, long story short, I, I, put, I got the picture from our buddy Joe Kroom, uh, put it up, and months later, Jordan Phillips gets released by the Arizona Cardinals. Bills pounce immediately assign him. You know what Brandon Bean said today, Ryan? Brandon Bean said that he talked to Stars reps before free agency started. He said, let's, let's let free agency play out. We'll see. We got some targets that we're going to go after, but we'll see how it plays out, if, if it still makes sense for us at the other end of this. After they signed Tim Settle and Daquan Jones, it was – Jordan Phillips getting cut and being available and the Bills signing him. That was the move that led to the Bills essentially cutting Starla Tule. So Jordan Phillips' best friend, he's basically one of his best friends. He's basically replacing him on the roster. The irony of that, I just thought was you couldn't write it any better than that. It's pretty wild. Maybe we'll see Star in a parking lot wearing a Jordan Phillips jersey in the Super Bowl or something this upcoming year. Who knows? Uh, but no, it is. It is really interesting. And that's that's the other stuff that I, I hope Bills fans appreciate when, when Brandon Bean has these pressers is how honest he is with the players, with the agencies. Uh, he, he doesn't kind of wait until the last minute and spring things on, on players and, oh, hey, surprise, we're, we're, you know, we're going to let go of you. He, he was open and honest with Stars rep saying, let's see what, what happens. But he mm -hmm. did not promise that it was part of the long-term plan. We saw with the, the Washington Commanders uh, th how they released a another defensive tackle this past week, and the agent took was really upset about it. He said, two weeks ago, you said we were rock solid, we were good, um, and it kind of uh, surprised them both, and it put them in a tough spot. So not every team does this, and the Bills are very open and honest with their players, the agents. That There's a reason, too, I think, that, agents are so willing to work with the bills it's because they've built up those relationships and they they don't they don't uh mince words they, they pretty much tell you exactly where that player stands going into training camp going into a draft going into free agency etc so we've been talking about Shaq lawson for months now i mean dating back to when the jets cut him and and, and the sense that we thought it made for the bills to add him for the playoff run, just because of what he brings in the locker room. We've seen the reaction that him signing back now officially has kind of garnered from some of the, some of the bills players. I mean, we've seen uh, Jordan Poyer is one guy that's uh, come out. I think Deion Dawkins had a comment as well. I mean, this is a guy that's loved in the room and, but I wrote about it yesterday, Ryan, these two guys, their stats together. Let me bring these up real quick because it's worth mentioning them in full. I don't think people really appreciate just how good Shaq Lawson and Jordan Phillips were in 2019 to get the deals that they got because 
ever since they left, the big thing, the big story has been like, man, Brandon Bean really lucked out there not signing those two guys. I think it just, you know, it came down to not the right fits for them. I, Shaq was okay in, in Miami, obviously the Houston to the Jets. It was, it was just like a mess. Like you, you go from signing that big extension, then you get traded less than a year later. So already you're not wanted already. You're kind of probably, you know, in your own, own head about it. You go to Houston where they trade you before the season even starts. Now you land with the Jets and they're going nowhere fast. It's a basically like a, a tank season for all intents and purposes. He doesn't have a great season. I, th- I think he had one or two splash plays that I remember. But now he gets to come back, both him and Jordan Phillips, who's dealt with some injuries in Arizona. It didn't go right for him there either. They get to come back to Buffalo and in a no-pressure situation. I mean, both of these guys, we're talking about fourth or fifth on the depth chart at their respective positions. I mean, I don't think, you know, Shaq Lawson, he might be able to take a, a vet role, maybe that Mario Addison role from a year ago, uh, or the Jerry Hughes. I, I think uh, Von Miller's in that Jerry Hughes role and potentially Shaq, but it, that's got to get played out. I mean, he's got to outperform all three of the young guys, Basham, Rousseau, and um, Epinesa. And so... I think that you go back and look at their stats from 2019, and I, I I brought it up right here. Combined 16 sacks, 26 tackles for a loss between the two of them, 48 pressures, and guess what? They both played about 50% of the snaps in Sean McDermott's rotation. So these guys have proven success in this system, and they're going to br- be brought back and asked to play roles lesser than the ones they filled in 2019. These are slam dunk home run signings. Yeah, and you nailed it. You know, Shaq Lawson maybe doesn't even make this team, and you can make the case for Jordan Phillips, too. I think Phillips has a better shot uh, from the inside. But th- they do fit this system, and that's so important. Uh, player fit m- is a big deal in the NFL, whether uh, people want to believe that or not. It- it's why some players sign monster contracts, and they don't come close to playing them out. They don't actually fit the system or the scheme. Um, player talent goes a-, a long way in the NFL, but being the right type of player for the right type of defense or the right type of offense uh, or the right type of blocking scheme. The list goes on and on. It's so crucial and important. We saw that Shaq Lawson every single year got better as a pass rusher. He was always solid as a, as a run stopper uh, in Buffalo. So he got better and better over the course of his career, especially under uh, those early years under Leslie Frazier before he left for that, the three for $30 million deal. Jordan Phillips, uh, you know, the nine and a half sacks looks a little, was a little, I, I don't want to say it was deceiving, but uh, a lot of them he cleaned up on plays and there's nothing wrong with that. A sack is a sack is a sack. Uh, but a lot of it had to do with the players around him. And when you have a Von Miller now and you have an Ed Oliver next to you and, and you could have some of these young players stepping up or Lawson stepping up, it wouldn't shock me or surprise me whatsoever if he had a very productive season getting after the quarterback, stopping the run. Um, both of them, their hearts were in Buffalo. Lawson was, was talking for the last few months about how he has been trying to get back to the bills this entire time. Jordan Phillips within minutes of being released was posting on Instagram about <laughs> mafia. I'm coming home. Um, it was one of those things where I almost felt guilty reporting that he was going to sign back. I'm like, well, I mean, the guy pretty much confirmed it on his own, but when, when you get the news, you get the news. Um, so he, that that also says something about the culture here, uh, the coaching staff, the players, the the bond that they have built over the last few seasons. Yeah, uh, you think Jordan Phillips was a little excited about uh, rejoining the Bills? Uh, uh, I think that's just safe a bet. To, just safe a bet. to say. Um, let's, you know, speaking of wearing your emotions uh, on your sleeve, uh, Brandon Bean today at the press conference. I've seen him get emotional when talking about like when the bills have lost and talking about what it means to see the bills fans at the airport and not getting it done for them. And, you know, there's been a couple of times like he got really heated when the whole, like people don't want to come to Buffalo thing was happening around Antonio Brown, if you remember, but it's very rare that you see anything, get him too ruffled up that he can't talk about it. Those were two instances uh, or really the Brown incident was the one lone one. The other one was just, you know, just, I was sick. He was sick to his stomach about like not being able to get the job done. That was a little bit of a different, um, different thing. But today when he was asked about the JD McKissick situation, 
And if you haven't heard, J.D. McKissick, former Washington uh, Commanders running back, signed a two-year deal with the Bills, now current Washington Commanders running back because he backed out of that deal, went back to the Washington Commanders. And today when that got brought up, Brandon Bean's tone and, and demeanor completely changed. And he basically said, listen, we had a deal in place. The agents basically told Washington, who weren't interested the whole time or, uh, along, uh, according to other reports, Sal uh, Capaccio put out a good uh, a good tweet with a little thread there about some information about it. They weren't interested at all until the Bills had an offer. Then it was like, oh, wait a second. We wanted to – and and Brandon Bean explained that, listen, when in this – in this league is a professional courtesy that when you get a deal done with a guy, the former team or the, or, or teams back out and they back out of the situation and, and the, the, the proceedings are, they end there. Well, Washington didn't, they pursued aggressively to get McKissick back. He ends up pulling out, going back to Washington. I think they probably played the, okay, you've been here for a couple of years. You have a house here. You have a, a place here. You're settled here. You know, this place come back. We have a role for you, whatever. He ends up going back there and the, Part of it that really stood out, Ryan, is Brandon Bean admitted that this makes things a bit complicated with a lot of former Carolina folks, including Ron Rivera, who's the head coach, seeing as this was kind of a dirty play from Washington and almost like they kind of took a player away from the Bills after they had come to terms with them. Yeah, when you agree to terms with the player, whether you know whether the contract has been signed or not, because I see someone saying he didn't sign. Yeah, he didn't sign a contract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it was the legal but, tampering. Period. Yeah, it, you're right. He agreed, he agreed to terms. Verbally, That's as close you know, as you yeah. can get right. to signing a contract at that point. But at that point, teams are supposed to back off. And, and the gist I get out of out of Bean, uh, Bean's presser today was maybe the team was just contacting McKissick directly. He went out mm. of his way to say the agents did a good job that, you know, um, so it, it's like that toy. Like you don't play with the toy for a while and then you see someone else playing with it. And you're like, well, wait a minute, that's mine. I, I, I want to play with that. Now Washington had no interest in resigning him. And all of a sudden the bills agree to terms and, and then you're interested and you want him back. It, it's weird. It, it's a dirty play. Like you mentioned, and it, it does, it complicates things. And listen, it, it's going to make things interesting um, come draft time, if there is a player in Washington wants to move back into round uh, a certain round because the Bills will be at the end of each round. If they want to move back into a round, don't call Buffalo. I don't think they're going to want to do business with you. Uh, it's going to be interesting in season with players and things like that too. I want you know maybe the Bills poach someone off of their practice squad at some point. Uh, the the gloves are are off. I think when it comes to this relationship and. and it's unfortunate because, like you said, there are some really long relationships there, um, like Rivera, who they've known for many, many years. And and in the NFL, it's just not supposed to happen like this. But we are still seeing things of this nature. And this was after the legal tampering, tampering period. But we heard about Sean McVay was trying to tug on Von Miller's heartstrings, too, after he kind of mm -hmm. found out that he was going to come to Buffalo. So. As much as it's frowned upon, I guess it probably happens more often than we know. Um, you know what happens far far more often than we know? Those like just middle of the day, maybe even late night, like hunger pangs when you just need something to eat. You can get yourself totally stocked up at Tops Friendly Markets. They got hot to go pizza, appetizers, signature fried chicken, baby back ribs, subs, delicious salads, brownie trays. Everything you need to feed the hungriest fan, head over to Tops today uh, and, and get yourself stocked up. You know who's probably starving right now is, is Stefan Diggs. Probably wants a new deal after looking at uh, that. Whoo! That uh, Devontae Adams mega contract, which was actually like, what a week of just big time splash moves, Ryan. Like, you know, Aaron Rodgers goes back. He does the, you know, huge extension after the weeks and months of drama. And then there, lo and behold, before long, boom, his top target is in uh, Las Vegas with broken mm -hmm. off a, in a big way. Uh, what were the contract terms on that? Do you remember off the top of your head? I think well, it was. I, go, ahead. go ahead. No, go I ahead. was just going to say that they actually kind of broke down the deal. And it, it's kind of like the offensive version of the Von Miller contract. It, it's, it looks really good when it was announced, but it's essentially a three-year deal 
Uh, it's going to pay him about 22 to 22 and a half million dollars on average. So it, it's not the type of money that you were looking at when it was initially announced. And that actually is probably good news for the bills when it comes to uh, eventually extending Stefan Diggs that they don't have to go into a different stratosphere. I just saw it right before we got on the show. Um, I want to say it was Florio that was talking about it of, of all people. And he mentioned it, and it wasn't quite as, as much as people were, were saying. But that's how all contracts are. You, you get mm-hmm. the initial terms. Uh, your, your eyes kind of bulge out of your head for a few minutes. And then the next day or two days later, the actual term's going like, oh, wait a minute. It's actually a two-year deal, a three-year deal. There's an out here. There's an out there. Um, so he's still making big money. Do not get me wrong. And he's going to be very happy, I'm sure, being uh, back with, with Carr. But it, still just blockbuster after blockbuster this off season. Um, man, what a bummer. Just seeing it come across my timeline. Uh, John Clayton, uh, formerly of ESPN for years and years and years, my childhood. Um, he was the Adam Schefter before Adam Schefter on ESPN, uh, passed away today. It appears, uh, rest, of, rest in peace to him. I mean, all of us football fans for years. I mean, if you were watching during the week, NFL reports, John Clayton was usually, uh, coming in with some type of scoop or some type of information, uh, you know, guys like that, uh, women like that, uh, professionals like that, I should say, uh, over the years, really just, you know, they, 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 they do so much to bring you into the sport, right? Like, yep. you know, for me growing up, Bob Costas was, if Bob Costas was, was, was on a television screen, I knew it was a big time event. Um, that's a real bummer. I know John Clayton did uh, local radio hits and WGR, uh, every week with uh, Shope and the Bulldog. Oh, man, rest in peace. Best of his family. Yeah, and uh, the one thing I think about, too, is his adapting to those ESPN, this is Sports Center commercials, the one where he had the long ponytail and he was like, listening to, like, Slayer and he's yelling for mo- his mom to bring up the meatloaf. Do you remember that commercial at all, Matt? I don't. Oh, Here, you got wa- to look for it Here's the thing. This. I'll have to look for it, but I, a little tidbit about me, actually. I've forever I'm like the the worst person to watch the Super Bowl with commercials come on I leave the room I I I change the channel I've never watched commercials to the point that the only time growing up that I would actually watch commercials is Bill's games because I wouldn't want to change the channel and then not get back in time for the game to be back but um yeah such sad news on John Clayton absolutely uh, and I did find the terms three years, 67 and a half million for Devonte Adams. So gotcha. big money, good money, something that the bills could probably use when negotiating, uh, you know, in, in time here with Stefan Diggs. So here was Brandon Bean was asked about it today from John Scott at spectrum sports. Uh, any potential for a new deal for Stefan, especially as the bills work to cr- probably create more cap space, right? Uh, maybe that's something, a lever that they can use. Here's the quote from Brandon Bean. I mean, We've got Stefan for two years, so we know that and we'll, at the right time, work with his reps and see if there's something to be done that makes sense for him. It's got to be fair. It's got to make sense for him, make sense for us. But Steph's been great. He reached out to Vaughn when he heard during the recruiting process. Josh did as well. He's a winner. He's all in on winning and sure everybody wants to be paid, but he wants to be on a winning team. And I think he's been the best version of himself. I don't see that being an issue. Literally a minute later, Stefan Diggs, and it might be unrelated. I don't know. It was uh, our real good uh, uh, buddy, Joe DiBiase, which, by the way, I think we've had everybody from GR on the show for the most part. I don't think we've had Chopin the Bulldog. Um, we haven't had Joe DiBiase on the show. That is a great oversight on my part. So we will rectify that. I'll reach out to him. Maybe we'll do a post free agency recap. You can find Joe with Sal Capaccio every day, 10 to 12. I, I make appearances all the time on that show. It's a, it's a great afternoon. Listen, uh, check that out. But he had a great tweet. He basically put John's reporting on the Stefan Diggs deal from Bean, and then a tweet from Stefan Diggs. It was just the hmm emoji. And so they were literally John's tweet and Stefan Diggs' tweet were a minute apart, maybe unrelated, but you got to get to a point where he start or think that you, you, he sees all these other deals happening and probably wants a little bit of a, a pay bump. I mean, he comes to the bills and since then this offense has been completely different, complete what he's done for Josh Allen. I don't think you could say any individual person has meant more to Josh Allen than Stefan Diggs. And he was an all pro in year one. He's, he was very unselfish last year with a lot of balls to go around. I think, you know, I know Brandon Bean doesn't want to like, 
you know, get himself into uh, any hot water with what he says in terms of the negotiating table. But I do think that Stefan Diggs definitely deserves a new deal. A hundred percent. And, you know, it's not the Bills MO to negotiate in season with players, but they've done it before. They've they've reached extensions. It wouldn't shock me if if in season this year the Bills do something where uh, they, they have some time to really sit down and lay out what the salary cap or what they project the salary cap to be in 2023. What kind of money do they have there? What can they do for Stefan Diggs in terms of a new deal and moving some money around? Um, so even in season this year, it wouldn't shock me. I don't think you're going to necessarily see anything before the start of the year, but in season's a possibility. And I think next off season, something gets done. Uh, even though he said, you know, we had two years left being the best version of yourself is important. Um, but eventually players too deserve to be paid for what, you know, their production. It's a, it's a league where the players, once you hit a certain age, once you hit a certain point, uh, that money's not there anymore. So I'm sure Stefan Diggs wants to get that money that he's earned and is coming his way. Thank you so much for watching on this Friday night. This is Shout the Buffalo Football Podcast brought to you by Tops Friendly Markets. Make sure if you're watching on YouTube, smash that like button right now. Uh, subscribe as well if you haven't already. Um, so Ryan Talbot, I think we could talk a little bit more big picture stuff for a moment. Uh, there's been a lot of activity uh, this offseason in the AFC West specifically, but we saw a, a major, major move happen in the AFC North. Uh, Cleveland Browns trade for Deshaun Watson. Uh, and I actually jokingly asked uh, Brandon Bean about, you know, is it does it feel like Madden with the way that these AFC teams are just seems like they're stocking up? And it's like he joked. He's like, yeah, I'm going to my vote is uh, for realignment. So he can go to the NFC and he joked too that when they, when he was in the NFC with the Panthers, it felt like they were going up against Drew Brees in his prime, Aaron Rodgers, Matt Ryan, when he was good. And, and now he feels like he's in the AFC and it's like, it's even more. I mean, I can't remember a time where there's this many good quarterbacks in one conference. And so now you're looking at a situation where, you know, the bills, the bills play a lot of really good quarterbacks next year. They're going to play the Cleveland Browns in, in, in Buffalo. And I feel like, they're in a good situation given that the AFC West is going to be so competitive. And I think the AFC East is going to be probably the least competitive of the four divisions. But when you get to the playoffs, there are just some heavyweight champions that are, you're going to have to go through. You're going to have to punch through to get to the Super Bowl. Yeah. It's, it's become even more important in these last few weeks for the bills to find a way to, uh, get the number one seed in the AFC this season. It, there's no other way around it. You, you mentioned, I mean, wild card weekend, there's going to be some heavyweight bouts coming up this year. Uh, there's just so many teams talent wise. Uh, if we're just talking about, you know, these guys as players, there, there's a lot of great quarterbacks in this conference. You know, you, you went back and talked about being when they were with the Panthers and the quarterbacks, you know, even Tony Romo back then and Eli Manning and early Russell Wilson, uh, that conference had a lot of good quarterback play. Now you look at it, and, it, and it's kind of like a little bit of a, a wasteland. And you you have the older guys and Brady and, and Rodgers, and then you have Dak, and you have um, you know in Arizona Kyler Murray. But it, it's kind of few and far between in terms of those proven entities. Where the AFC is just loaded. You, you obviously have Josh Allen in the AFC East. In, in the North, there's Watts and there's Burrow. Um, and, and that's a stacked conference. Obviously, Lamar Jackson, former NFL MVP, the West is stacked. Uh, there's, there's no easy path necessarily to the Super Bowl in this conference. So getting that number one seed is going to be really important. Taking care of business in your division, Buffalo, and obviously just overall in general is just going to be so big this year. All right, so... I put out the uh, episode on Twitter so people could kind of come over to YouTube, watch the show. You can also watch it on Twitter and Facebook, wherever, you know, it's best for you. The YouTube, um, I push the YouTube more, Ryan, because it gives you the multi-platform experience if you want it. Like you can watch it on the TV, you can watch it on a computer, you can watch it on a phone. And I, I'm pretty sure you could probably do that with Twitter or Facebook too if you have like a, a smart TV maybe. I don't know, but I just feel like there's a YouTube app. It's easy whatever. Um, but if you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, subscribe as well. When I put the episode out on Twitter, I asked for some questions. We did get some, so let's fire through these, uh, you know, rapid fire style. Um, I'll say one, you answer it. I'll do another one. I'll answer it. And we'll just kind of go down the line like that. Love it. All right. 
if Ryan Bates gets a deal elsewhere and they don't match, do you think Cody Ford becomes the incumbent starter or do they hit the market much like last year when they brought in Forrest Lamp or save it for the draft for competition? That comes from the ghost of Ralph Kruger <laughs> on, on Twitter. <laughs> uh, well, I think they definitely find a uh, few more options of free agency if that becomes the case. You're not just going to hand a starting position out. The Bills have always been very good about having – competition going into training camp uh, a lot of offensive linemen even pre-draft uh, there, there's even if the bills go out and they sign two other guys one other guy um if if they lose baits i still wouldn't be shocked if the bills drafted two interior offensive linemen in this year's draft class they are always adding competition on this offensive line and it's the, one of the best things that that bean does every single year is, is have those competitions ha, you know may the best man win maybe you can trade off some of the guys that aren't going to make this roster. Maybe you can stash some on your practice squad, whatever the case may be. But no, if they lose Bates, they are very thin at offensive guard and they need, it's more of a necessity than anything else to sign one or two more guards, even before the draft, just to make sure that you, you have some internal options there. If, if the board doesn't fall uh, the way that, that you hope it does on, on draft night on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Mm-hmm. You answered that pretty well. Uh, Mark Gump asks on Twitter, can we get Fitzpatrick, Ryan Fitzpatrick, come back to Buffalo to be QB2? Matt Barkley is a good dude, but he's not good enough to be QB2. All right, so I got a couple thoughts here. I I know I get killed for this a little bit. People get real in their feelings about the backup quarterback position. I, I think we overvalue. Like, There's probably three teams in the NFL that if their starter went down, they're going to be really competitive over a long stretch of time. It just it just doesn't really tend to happen. I think like, like a Case Keenum, a guy like that, a Marcus Mariota, it gives you a chance. But if you're a Super Bowl contender and you turn things over to Case Keenum and Marcus Mariota or Jameis Winston or uh, Kyle Allen, um, you know Ryan Fitzpatrick, in, given his age and coming off the injury that he's coming off, I really don't see it. I, I don't see that you're you're able to sustain over a long period of time. So. I don't, I don't necessarily think that the funds were better spent on a backup quarterback. Here, I kind of like this Matt Barkley development if it ends up being the case that he's back in the mix. A, he doesn't have to be QB2. He could be QB2 for now until you figure out maybe a better situation. You know, um, Jake Fromm may be, may be out there. Maybe that's a, a path that you want to go down. He's been in the system before. Or maybe you don't. Maybe you, you saw enough of him in New York and you're ready to move on from based on what you learned from him in your building. Ryan, the Bills have nine draft picks. Draft a quarterback. Draft a fourth or fifth round quarterback or maybe even a third round quarterback. Whoever you think can come in here, maybe try to comp it as much as you can to Josh Allen. And just, it doesn't have to be a world beater. It doesn't have to be somebody that's going to be a starter in this league, but somebody that could come in here that you can kind of develop behind Josh Allen, let him compete with Matt Barkley. But I'm much more in favor of the cost-effective approach at QB2 than going out, like somebody mentioned today, I think, not to throw him under the bus, but John Scott advocating all week. Cause I've been working out with him. Uh, I go to his gym now. Uh, he's, he's my personal trainer and uh, he's been talking about Andy Dalton all week. And I'm like, John, Andy Dalton's is going to cost money minimum $7 million. You're not getting a backup quarterback of Andy Dalton's caliber for less than 7 million. It's like the going rate. And maybe he's out there longer. He's going to have to take less maybe, but it's not dipping below 5 million. And I don't think the bills can pay 5 million to a backup quarterback with the way they've constructed this roster. Now that they they're paying Von Miller. Yeah. Matt was Mitch Trubisky in your opinion, a, a top three backup last year in this, in the NFL. I thought he was number one backup in the NFL last year. And if Josh Allen had gone down in the playoffs, would you have had confidence in Mitch Trubisky to win it all and to take the Bills to the Super Bowl? My, my answer to that is, yeah, zero. So at the end of the day, what, what are we doing here? Uh, it's nice to have that option for the two to four games in the regular season if you need it. But if you're starting quarterback in today's NFL, and I'm, any starting quarterback goes down for an extended period of time, that team's gone. They're not going to go far. They're not going to win at all. If something happens to Mahomes and he's out for the year, Chad Henney's not leading them to the promised land. If, if Tom Brady goes down, his backup's not leading them to the promised land. You can say this for any quarterback. I, I'll say it in Green Bay where they have a young guy, Jordan Love, drafted in the first round. If something happens to Aaron Rodgers, they're going nowhere fast. So if you have the capital, if you see a good fit, 
by all means, get, get that backup that you think could come in for that two to four game stretch, keep you afloat, maybe go two and two and keep you in the, the race for the number one seed. But at the end of the day, if it's a long term injury or something happens to your quarterback, there's no backup in this league that's going to necessarily run the gauntlet. And I know the Nick Foles story uh, was great a few years ago, but Foles is someone that fit the system perfectly. There's a lot of talent on the defense on that team. It, it happens once in a lifetime. It doesn't happen every single year, and, and it wouldn't happen in, in Buffalo or elsewhere if, if their franchise quarterbacks went down. Do you think uh, Stefan Diggs, this comes from uh, Cole Shelton on Twitter, would consider holding out or asking for a trade uh, if he doesn't get a contract? No, I, I, I don't. I, I don't see him going that route. I think if anything, um, especially not the, the trade part, but – when it comes to the holdout, I think if anything, he's going to go out there. He's going to perform. He's going to show the Bills his importance to this offense. Uh, and like I said, I wouldn't be surprised the Bills played ball with him in season. I just don't see that happening. Um, he, he hasn't given any kind of indication that that's something that he would do here in Buffalo at this point. So I don't want to just assume something like that personally. And final question, I'll take it here and feel free to chime in as well, Ryan. Do you think – this comes from Sarah Larson – uh, wide receiver two is a priority, or do you think Gabe Davis is ready to step into that spot? Uh, what is your take on all the mumbling surrounding Diggs? Should we be worried? Why isn't a contract extension be a priority when it would help the cap and secure him as a bill till retirement? Um, let me just add in on Diggs. Like part of this, I think that it may be a sticking point is that Brandon Bean is a big believer in like he's extended Micah Hyde, he's extended Jordan Poyer, but like two years left on the deal. I think he emphasized that today. I think that's a part of this is that like he wants Stefan Diggs here long-term, but it's got to be at the right time. Um, maybe it ends up happening before the season. Maybe it ends up happening after the season. Who knows? But I, I just don't think that he's looking at it in the same way because there's still contract years left on that deal. that Stefan Diggs signed. Um, but I, we've already covered this. I, I think he deserves the pay bump. I think he deserves the new deal. So I think that's a, that, that should happen. We talked about this the other day uh, about wide receiver two. I was more on the, the side of the fence that I think Gabriel Davis is cement him in, lock him in as, as wide receiver two. Whereas Ryan, well, I won't put your words in your mouth, but maybe he needs to prove it a little bit more. Um, I think we're at the point with Gabriel Davis. Like that was to me, the Kansas city game was a career altering performance for Gabriel Davis. I mean, he's going to come into this training camp. I'm sure going to work harder this off season to improve his game, knowing the kind of um, things that he can reach as a, as a wide receiver too. I mean, ideally he became wide receiver one in that game in the fourth quarter, everybody in the stadium in Kansas city, everybody on the chiefs defense knew that the ball was going to Gabriel Davis. They couldn't do a thing to stop it. And listen, the Kansas city defense had its struggles at times last year, but, um, I think cornerback two, cornerback in general as a position group, is much more priority right now for me than wide receiver because of what we've talked about with Trey White coming off of the injury, Dane Jackson, the only viable starter on the roster right now. We're big Cam Lewis fans on this roster uh, or on the show. He's played more in the slot in recent years. I know he can do it on the outside, but you got to add at that position. There's a couple people that are out there, um, and then obviously in the draft. Yeah, uh, you, you know, Steven Nelson, Bills were kind of linked to him for a while last year. He's still out there to the best of my knowledge, unless something happened later, you know, late today. I believe he's still available. I wouldn't be surprised if the Bills just kind of waiting to see uh, who's sitting out there on the market to, for a few more days. And then all of a sudden the price tag comes down and those players end up looking for situations where they can win and they can uh, rebuild their, their stock, so to speak. So a, a guy like Nelson makes sense. Um, there's a few other veterans out there that we talked about on our last show that, that are on the market as well, that haven't been signed anywhere yet. So th there's still a lot of talent available. There's still a lot of talent in this draft class in general that you can get in the first two rounds, three rounds that could come in and be day one starters, uh, or compete for that job opposite Trey white. So uh, I think cornerback though, skyrockets towards the top of the list currently, Guard could be up there pretty high, depending on what happens with Ryan Bates, even after they signed Roger Saffold, uh, just because you need the depth, you need some competition, you need someone that maybe can come in and be a, a starter year one. So that's high on the list. 
But in, in such a deep wide receiver draft class, I, I think the Bills would be very wise to use one of their first three or four picks on a wide receiver. I was going to get out of here on that one, but there's a really good question that uh, coming from Steve Nets over on Twitter. Uh, so we will answer it uh, hanging out here late on a Monday, uh, Friday night. Is OJ Howard essentially the replacement for Cole Beasley? Does this lessen the need for another wide receiver? I think it kind of goes in line with, with what we were just talking about. But I think that's interesting because OJ Howard does kind of offer that slot, that big slot opportunity. Brandon Bean spoke today about OJ Howard specifically, and, and he went back to when they had Jeremy Shock, Shockey and Greg Olson in Carolina offering that big, fast wide receiver that can get open down the seam. That's something that I think the two tight end opportunities now at Ken Dorsey's uh, disposal, that's something to really consider. I think they're going to try to utilize both of those guys as long as Howard can stay healthy. Um, I asked specifically today, uh, Brandon, about Isaiah replacing uh, Isaiah McKenzie replacing Cole Beasley. Here's what he said. I think Isaiah is going to get every chance, no matter what we do in free agency or the draft or whatever, whether it's adding another free agent, we're going to have competition. We do that everywhere. The draft, who knows? There's always going to be someone after the draft that's another cap casualty or in June. So we'll continue to add that. But Isaiah showed us things last year when he got his opportunities late in the season. And we're looking forward to see the kind, uh, kind of where he can take that. So for me, I think that Isaiah McKenzie's in line for quite the um, uh, role upgrade now here signing a two-year deal in 2022. I agree completely. And listen, it, a lot of defenses, you know they're bread and butter. In those games where they go against man defense, those are the games where I think he could put on a show week in, week out like he did uh, against the Patriots. And, and he, that doesn't mean he can't play against zone defenses either, teams that play a lot of zone uh, but there, there's going to be games where he's going to he's going to be in the spotlight. And he's going to have a big role. And, and we saw that with Cole Beasley over the course of his career, he had those games where he was eight tar, uh, or eight receptions on 12 or 13 targets. And then he would disappear for a few weeks. It, it's not that he wasn't a good player for those two weeks. It's just based on on the scheme they're going against, the matchups that they have. So Isaiah McKenzie is going to have a big role. And then going back to that original question. OJ Howard can be a big slot, a, a big slot receiver type of option. So you can use him in personnel packages that way. You can run more two tight end sets. Uh, I think that is something that Ken Dorsey wants to do. It hasn't been Buffalo's MO the last few years, but this is the beauty of having a new offensive coordinator. They're going to try new things. They're going to try to uh, work with personnel groupings and, and see what works best. So when you add another athletic option, like Howard, that tight end room where you already have Dawson Knox uh, and you have a quarterback that can keep plays alive with his legs and, and kind of maybe let Howard uh, roam a little bit, get free and, and create the separation, those mismatches. Yeah, I could see him being used in, in both a slot type of role and also as a traditional tight end. I'm wondering, let's do like a mini poll here. Would people like it better if I like made myself symmetrical to Ryan in terms of like mm -hmm. where we sit on the screen? I'd have to like... I'd have to like pop up my, my screen here and actually get a little shot of my ceiling, the plumbing and everything like that. So we'll probably bring it back down. I'm just actually, I'm actually really far away. I just have a gigantic head. So gotcha. But I was just thinking about it. Cause I'm always like kind of far back on my side and you're like really close to the screen. Right. I'm always, always wondering like, what would it look like if we were just like next to each other? So like, I'm going to try to make it perfectly like a line. There we go. So now I'm going to yeah smile big. Cause I'm going to screenshot. I'm going to screenshot this and I'm going to put side by side and we'll, we'll do like a little social media vote and see what people like, like better. Um, okay. I think that's all I got. Um, it's been a long week, man. I've written a lot of stories. You've written a lot of stories. We've done three shows. Christopher symmetry. He wants the symmetry. Uh, John says it was perfect as it was. Um, I think that's just so it. I think people going nowhere yet. We're, we're yeah. I think people. I think people are just going to accept us for who we are. Either way, like either way, we want to do it. So that's fine, guys. You've been so awesome. Um, this show is one of the favorite parts about our job. Uh, it's great. We get to engage with you guys, talk to you guys. We still got to put together our, our 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 wings and beers with Matt Herman. We have to set up our fan show from the contest. I still have t-shirts I have to get out. I haven't forgot about it. Uh, forgotten about it. Hit me up if you're listen if you're a regular listener to the podcast and you want a t-shirt, 
hit me up. I'm going to, I'm going to pull up that episode and get the winners. And that, as a matter of fact, I have all the names here in the, in the tops reads. And speaking of tops reads, if you're hosting a large party, check out tops, huge selection of party platters. They're delicious, effortless, affordable. They're no stress ways to impress complete details. Stop by their carry out cafe. Visit topsmarkets.com. There was something else I wanted to get to before we got out of here, Ryan. Hmm. The switching around the different angles kind of threw me off. Um, can you help me out here? Do you know, do you know what I was going to go for? I don't actually, I don't, what, what, what am I forgetting about here? I don't know. Um, I think that's it. All right. So <laughs> for, for Ryan Talbot, uh, I am Matt Perino. Uh, this has been a, a really fun week. We'll, we'll be right back at this thing next week to bring you more coverage. Brandon Bean said there's a few more moves kind of coming. I think a backup quarterback, probably a veteran cornerback as well. Uh, so we'll we'll have our, our usual probably Wednesday show. I'm going to work on a couple guests for our next couple of shows. we got to get those kind of popping, and then we'll go from there. RJ says tacos. Never forget tacos. If, if it is taco, whether it's Tuesday or not, eat, eat your tacos, Ryan Talbot. That's right. And Sophia, I, I see the talk punters comment you put in here twice in the last minute or so. We're, we're going to kick that down the road to our next show. We will talk punters. You have my word on it. Beautiful. All right. Take care, everybody. Enjoy your weekend. Hopefully the weather stays the way that it is in Western New York. If you're here, uh, get out and enjoy it. I'm going to the basketball games tomorrow. So big night. I'm excited.